Welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily. I'm Aaron Porras. And I'm Natasha Kircha. Coming up in today's newscast, heavily armed gunmen shoot up a kosher supermarket in New Jersey. Jews are officially recognized as an ethnic minority in America. And thanks to an Israeli startup, the wait for brewing whiskey is finally a heck of a lot shorter. Quiet Tuesday afternoon in New Jersey has quickly turned upside down as the sounds of gunfire began ringing through the streets. This is Greenville in Jersey City, around the corner from the JK Kosher supermarket. It's the only kosher supermarket in the area, a staple of the local Jewish community with a yeshiva and a synagogue next door. And it was also the scene of a deadly shootout between police and several unidentified gunmen last night. At least six people are dead, three bystanders, one police officer, and two suspected shooters. And another several officers have been wounded as well, alongside civilians running for cover and three more Hasidic Jews who were reportedly shot inside the store while trying to escape. There were two incidents today at two different locations, one at Bayview Cemetery and one at a corner store um, at Bayview and Martin Luther King. Um, I want to start by just saying that the Jersey City Police Department did a phenomenal job um, and it's a very tough day for them. Uh, two officers were shot. Um, one recently gave his life uh, and was pronounced at the Jersey City Medical Center and uh, the second officer uh, was shot in the shoulder and uh, he should recover and then two other officers are uh, receiving medical treatment due to uh, shrapnel. Residents report being trapped in the line of fire and schools were all put on lockdown. A third suspect is reported as possibly on the run, but a suspicious man has since been arrested at the Holland Tunnel on the way to Manhattan, possibly in relation to the shooting. And Jersey City Mayor Stephen Fulop says the threat is now over, adding that he's in contact with the Jewish community while it reels from the attack. Still, citing the location and victims, many view the shooting as anti-Semitic. The ultra-Orthodox community is centered in the area with about 100 families nearby. And community members are calling on Mayor Fulop to clearly declare this as a targeted attack. Jersey City Police described the event as very extensive, however, and spanning at least three locations. They recount the attack as starting in a cemetery where police officer detective Joseph Seals was gunned down. Seals was 40 years old and the father of five. Then the attack reportedly moves a mile away towards the Jewish supermarket, and there five more deaths are reported following the tense and hours-long standoff. We're not going to get into the details of four hours of police work, but I can tell you their movement was, was rapid and continuous for four hours within that area. Victims include the two suspected gunmen and three bystanders, two of whom the local Jewish Chabad identifies as supermarket owner Leah Minda Ferenz and Moshe Deutsch. Both are members of the Hasidic ultra-Orthodox community in Greenville. Oh! It's an amount. It's, an amount. it's devastating news. It's uh, hard to watch that imagery, honestly. Uh, but And then we've just been given an update. One of the gunmen, at least one of the gunmen, has now been uh, found to have posted anti-Semitic comments online, adding more uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the thought that this was a targeted attack. Now, meanwhile, in related news, President Trump has now announced his latest plan to fight the growing anti-Semitism in the United States. In the hours around the New Jersey supermarket shooting, the Jewish community is holding its breath again, waiting for some sort of action to be taken against the rise in anti-Semitic crime. And now, as a cliche place to encounter such hate, university campuses are particularly on edge. While United States President Donald Trump is now set to sign an executive order recognizing Jewish university students as a protected class. Specifically, he'll be extending Title VI protections of the Civil Rights Act to cover anti-Semitic rhetoric on college campuses. And effectively, this would officially recognize Jews as an ethnic minority in the United States, affording them federal protections from discrimination. Therefore, institutions that then fail to address anti-Semitism on campus risk losing federal funding as well as discrimination lawsuits. And the signing is scheduled to coincide with the annual White House Hanukkah parties later this month. Why do this through executive order, though? 
At least one bipartisan bill to do the same thing is already circulating through Congress. While supporters are praising Trump for bypassing Congress to get the job done, like Israeli Foreign Minister Israel Katz, who is calling on other nations to now adopt similar measures. And several pro-Israel and Jewish groups similarly say that this will help to combat the rise of anti-Jewish and anti-Israel hate. But critics like the Jewish Democratic Council of America call the move a simple PR stunt, accusing President Trump of being more interested in symbolic gestures that politicize Israel and the Jews. Either way, many hail this decision as another reason President Trump is supposedly the most Israel and Jewish friendly president in U.S. history, especially after changing U.S. policy on the settlements, recognizing the Golan as Israeli, recognizing Jerusalem as the Israeli capital, and then moving the embassy in Khan. And by the way, the United States Embassy in Jerusalem on Monday finally received permits to build. Construction is expected to break ground within a year. And now joining us via Skype with more on the rise in anti-Semitic crimes worldwide is Dr. Ephraim Zulaf, chairman of the Simon Wiesenthal Center in Jerusalem. So how would you explain the recent rise in anti-Semitism around the world in the last few days? First of all, the nature of anti-Semitism is such that a lot of this is copycat uh, incidents. In other words, the more incidents that take place without the perpetrators being apprehended and punished, and punished seriously, severely, the more we'll see of this, unfortunately. Well, now, at the same time, we've seen a lot of countries uh, like France with the new bill that they just recently passed uh, and adoption of the IHRA definition, plus, plus President Trump's recent decision, uh, again, that we just covered to recognize Jews as an ethnic minority. Is this the right way to fight this phenomenon? Listen, the IRA definition is excellent. It's precisely the definition that should be adopted. The question is the implementation. Yeah. In other words, it's fine, it's important to make that declaration, but you have to see to it that those people who commit anti-Semitic acts as defined by the IRA definition are punished for it. Now, talk to us a little bit about this move by Trump um, to, to essentially um, label Jews as an ethnic minority rather um, than a religious group. What does that mean for the Jewish community in the United States and worldwide? That, that's a good question. It's hard to say what effect it'll have. But I just want to tell you that for centuries, Jews in America made sure that they were only classified as a religious group and not as an ethnic group because of the fear of the, of the accusation of double loyalties. Interesting. So you don't think that the Jewish community is necessarily embracing this move? I don't think so. I think that especially in the left-wing uh, you know, uh, part of American Jewry, which is considerable, they will not like this at all. Well, to what degree is this a damned if you do, damned if you don't type of scenario? <laughs> That's precisely the problem. First of all, no one knows how this is going to play out because it's never been done before. Now, you're an expert on anti-Semitism and the Holocaust. Um, and in the beginning of the week, we saw German Chancellor Merkel visiting Auschwitz. Do you feel um, as if... Well, as the European countries are doing enough to respect the remembrance of the Holocaust, especially given this rise in anti-Semitic incidents? Listen, the question isn't only the memory of the Holocaust. There are plenty of people who have no problem paying respects to dead Jews but can't stand live Jews. This is, this is a serious problem because in Germany, we're talking about a country whose prime minister, Angela Merkel, has said, in, I believe it was in 2008, that Israel's security is a national interest of Germany. And we're seeing this past year, vote after vote against Israel in the Security Council, in the, in the United Nations. And, and this is by Heiko Maas, who's now foreign minister, who said that he went into, into politics because of Auschwitz. And I'm sitting here wondering, maybe there's another Auschwitz we don't know about. Thank you so much for joining Thank us. Thank you, Dr. And Zara. Hopefully, we are going to see something change. Yeah. Thank you. Hopefully. <laughs> All right. Now, with an attack targeting Jews in the U.S. and statistics showing anti-Semitism on the rise in Europe, a recent incident in France is unfortunately not surprising. Yeah, but what is unusual is the ways that lawmakers are now responding to the hate. It's not every day that the Prime Minister of Israel makes a call to a private citizen's cell. 
But Tuesday, Netanyahu felt compelled to pick up the phone to comfort a 30-year-old man identified as Yogev, who was attacked and knocked unconscious on the Paris metro on Monday. Yogev says he was speaking with his father in Hebrew as he was boarding the train when he was assaulted by two men who Yogev describes as being of African origin. And this comes less than a week after France adopted the IHRA's definition of anti-Semitism in order to combat the anti-Jewish sentiments that have been increasingly sweeping across the country. But in any case, Prime Minister Netanyahu gave Yogev the full support of the Jewish state in seeking justice, while French authorities launched their investigations. With today's news filled with an unfortunate amount of anti-Semitic incidents, it can be hard to see any bright side. Absolutely, but ILTV's Emmanuel Kadosh is actually here to give us the rundown on some amazing initiatives that are fighting against the anti-Semitism around the world. That's right. Hi, guys. So the first motivating initiative looking to help change the conversation comes from the cosmetics billionaire and president of the World Jewish Congress, Ronald Lauder. He just set aside $25 million to start a new organization devoted to rooting out the growing tide of anti-Semitism in American politics. That's interesting. I mean, Lauder is a longtime Republican donor, if I remember correctly, as well. Right. right that is right. Um, he said he does plan on using this organization to go after both Democrats and Republicans who traffic in anti-Semitic language. It's set to be called the Anti-Semitism Accountability Project and will consist of both nonprofit and a super PAC. He says, quote, it's my money and what I stand for. He continued on to say that although I'm a lifelong Republican, anti-Semitism knows no political party. Mm. Well, which is such an important thing to say, to yeah, be quite honest. Right. Now, I understand you have another story that you're going to share right, with us. Right, definitely. Um, the next story I have for you isn't any less impressive. Players from the Corinthian soccer team, which which is one of Brazil's most popular team, took the field Wednesday wearing stars of David on their jersey to wow. remember the mark to remember the mark of the beginning of the Holocaust. And it was such a proud moment reading and then seeing this go down. Um, I actually saw that a lot of the seats in the stadium displayed yellow stars as well with the message, a star not to forget. So. Right. Such an amazing and thoughtful idea. It's like really insightful to do uh, to do this on, on the team's part. Right, right. right. Um, one initiative I wanted to mention as well, Tamar Morali, who was actually mm -hmm. the first Jewish woman to make it as far as she did in the Miss Germany contest um, and was named Germany's Miss Internet, Internet in 2018. Um, she saw a need to make a difference about anti-Semitism in Germany and Europe and decided to start a campaign called Shalom. Now, I remember that you had her on the show to talk about her experience in the Miss Germany beauty contest. Right. Also, she was on Israel Daily as yes. well. Um, so what exactly is this campaign about? Right. So when she reached out to me to tell me about the campaign, I knew it was going to be something powerful. She teamed up with some of the biggest influencers in Germany that have a huge engagement count to share an incredible message. But let's hear her take it away. All right. Well, joining us now on Skype is Tamara Morali herself. So tell us a little bit about your campaign. So hi, everyone. As you can see, uh, my campaign is called Shalom. It's a campaign I'm doing together with place to be And place to be is a platform that um, hosts events for the biggest influencer in whole Germany. So I was thinking that's a great um, opportunity to actually um, make a statement against something that in Germany is sadly very common, which is anti-Semitism. And I wanted to change the source a little because anti-Semitism is something that we can only hear from uh, the Jewish communities and in general, like, yeah, Jewish people. So I wanted to involve uh, the other side, which is like um, non-Jewish people who are not aware of what anti-Semitism is actually, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, is about. So and I wanted to do it on Instagram, which is like the platform, of course, with the highest reach and everyone can share posts or and screenshot them or talk about them. So I wanted to use a platform that a young generation is using. Right. In their so how many people have bought these hoodies so far? Mm -hmm. what, have, what has the reaction been like who's supporting this campaign? So um, we only work with influencers and bloggers um, in Germany. So we uh, gave out 200 uh, sweatshirts like these to wow. To people who are very well known in Germany, and right now um, we are working on um, how to communicate those messages. So we are exchanging ideas how to um, to make the posts, how to make the stories, because they are, were never involved in a, a campaign as such, and that's why we want to make sure that the communication is uh, well understood 
and um, yeah, and I must say, like it's a it's a completely uh, different campaign as uh, people are used to, especially because uh, so many influencers already told us that they are not sure if it's it's something for them because they think it's too sure. political or they're really scared. that's too political. Yeah. I was I was wondering what was to the reaction? Shalom, yeah. yeah, what was the yeah, re I mean, so, will they? So were, are people all people doing it? There are even people who say they're um, scared to lose followers, which is exactly the point why it's so necessary to start something like this. Because there isn't like there's no way that people should be afraid of losing followers just because they are standing for shalom in this case, meaning peace. Like Absolutely. it's not about choosing any sides. That's not what we want. It's not a political statement at all. It's just to say that we want peace, which means shalom. And, um, yeah, that's all about it. All right. Thank you so much for joining us, Tamal. Thank you so much. Thanks for your support. Absolutely. All right, moving on. The deadline to choose a prime minister-elect is now just a few hours away. So barring a last-minute negotiation miracle, uh, it looks like Israelis will officially be heading back to the polling booths in March. Exactly. And the Knesset seems to know it, too. Five MKs of the short-lived 22nd Knesset have now introduced a bill to dissolve the parliament and set a date for new elections on March 2nd, 2020. And this will be the third election in Israel in just 11 months' time, an unprecedented scenario that has everyone upset. But meanwhile, party leaders are posturing that there's still time to negotiate. In a video statement, Blue and White leader Benny Gantz calls on Prime Minister Netanyahu to return to the table and commit to previous promises, including not seeking immunity. Netanyahu, however, accuses Gantz of spin and instead is calling on Gantz to join in his broad unity government. But no meetings have been announced either way between the two anyway. And now as for the public, a new Channel 13 poll now shows that Netanyahu may end up taking much of the heat for this breakdown in talks. The Blue and White Party is expected to expand its one-seat lead over the Likud to four seats. And other parties on the right are also expected to take a hit, with the United Right List and the right-wing Otsma Yehudit failing to pass the electoral threshold completely. This also gives the center-left and the Arab bloc a total of 60 seats. But overall, the numbers aren't changing too much from the first two elections' results. And 60 seats are also not enough for a coalition anyway. So with luck, something definitive will happen, and fast. All right, now Israel has a number of reputable universities, but now students who are caught up between wanting to be by the beaches of Tel Aviv and Central Park in New York won't have to choose. That's right. They'll still get to claim Ivy League status, and that's perhaps the biggest deal here. Now, here with the details on a new prestigious program is ILTV's Shana Fultz. So, Shana, give us the details. Okay, so this is a dream. This is a program between Tel Aviv University and Columbia University. That's why we say between the beaches and, and the parks. So, this program is going to be two years beginning undergraduate in Tel Aviv and two years in Manhattan, on Upper Manhattan, and the, the program is going to be rolled out in fall 2020. And, and essentially what it means is that you're getting an Ivy League degree, but you're also able to study here in Tel Aviv for two years. But doesn't yes. Columbia University already have a program with Ben Gurion? So they already have a study abroad program. Now mm. study abroad is usually uh, one semester and you just do sort of a, um, you move your credits somewhere else. This is actually a dual degree program. So you can choose what you want to study and you are between two places for two, for two years at a pop, sure. and uh, you get two degrees at the end, one from Tel Aviv University and That's one amazing. from Columbia. All right, so what, off, what you know, programs are being offered here uh, to, to potential students? Is it like, yeah. So the nice thing is I thought that maybe it would be limited, but they have right. a nice selection of programs. There's Jewish studies, Israel studies, Middle East studies, but there's also psych, lit, some interesting communication and digital culture program that I had never heard of before. So wow. you can, and a philosophy program, so you can kind of uh, get a good range here. Everything. I wish that this had existed when I was applying to college. It sounds amazing. Yeah. Yes. 
All right. Well, there there are. You're too late. I mean, I think that there is another Ivy League school that has uh, 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 is that works in collaboration with the university here. Right? Yeah. So the so this is on the rise. There are a lot of universities in Israel that are now teaming up with Ivy League schools. Another one is between the Technion and Cornell, which is a great program. Oh, right. It's specially designed for people in high tech to come here and and get their feet wet. Something else I wanted to mention is that you're paying prices with this new program at between Tel Aviv University. In Columbia, um, the Columbia program is over sixty thousand dollars a year, and TAU is between thirteen and sixteen thousand dollars a year. So you can slash half half your cost there. So it's worth it. Interesting, That's amazing. Really All right, thank you so much uh -huh. for joining us, Shana. Thank you. All right, now plaster. We use it for everything, and pretty much anyone can make it. But when did humans figure out how to use mineral powders to make this substance? Well, a recent archaeological finding now says that mankind figured it out nearly 2,000 years prior to original estimations. Up in Israel's Galilee is a burial ground called Ein Gev, and people who lived there 12,000 years ago were using plaster to seal graves shut. And the findings are a significant breakthrough, indicating that the Natufian civilization actually had capabilities far greater than previously imagined. Their plaster production indicates an important shift in mankind as humans learn to use their environment to make materials that could help them in everyday life, too. Now, researchers believe the plaster was used in ritual funeral ceremonies, and since 2010, when the excavations first began at the site, eight skeletons had been found all with an unusual white substance on them. They apparently had been buried under a 40-centimeter thick layer of dense white material, which researchers say is limestone, a common resource that's used to mix plaster even today. But not only did this community make the limestone powder, they also were able to burn rocks at extremely high temperatures in order to make the plaster malleable. So researchers think that the plaster was mixed over burning rocks and then immediately poured over bodies in the grave. In fact, the plaster was made with such high quality that one of the skeletons found was very much intact when uncovered. Now, most industries have had a revamp with their technological revolutions of sorts, except for liquor production. That process has been distilling for 150 plus years, and it finally might be getting a reboot thanks to an Israeli startup who says they can make whiskey in a matter of weeks. Take a look at this. When it comes to liquor, age is everything. But now an Israeli startup called Verstil is changing the game with modern technology. You see, whiskey is 40% alcohol, 59% water, and 1% acid, esters, and other molecules. And that 1% is what creates the complexity, flavor, and scent of whiskey. Verstil uses a molecular distillery to change the reaction of elements and flavors within the barrel. And they use something they call hyper-aging technology to accelerate those natural reactions. The product won the company first place at the Fresh Start Food Tech Incubator Challenge in September. And because whiskey making is considered an art form by those in the business, introducing technology to the process has been considered taboo. But the founders of Verstel say experts can tell the difference in the quality of the whiskey and the advancement could bring down the cost of a bottle by half the price. Very exciting news about whiskey. That's uh, probably my I favorite know. news. All right, now you might not know this, but Israel is situated in the perfect location for bird watchers as thousands of species make their way from one continent to another twice each year. But while the birds visit looks beautiful, it's incredibly costly to the local fish market. It's actually estimated that roughly 50,000 pelicans are now flying through the region from the Balkans to Africa, and every year, with few places to stop and eat, they end up raiding Israeli fish farms. Well, the farmers have since taken up loudspeakers, lasers, and firing blank gunshots into the air, among other efforts, to drive the flocks away. But nothing seems to work. And it's no joke, millions of shekels are lost to the birds every year. So what to do? Well, the answer seems to lie in the age-old saying, if you can't beat them, join them, rather than fight the birds. For choice stock in the pools, Israeli fish farmers and the Nature and Parks Authority have created alternative feeding sites, and hundreds of truckfuls of live yet unmarketable fish now get sent up to designated reservoirs in the north, where the pelicans have learned to come for a tasty snack. Yeah, the only problem now is that some say the birds might get used to their luxury stopover, maybe even deciding to stay for the whole winter. That would be interesting. All oh, right. Yeah, interesting. Now, on that note, let's take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight should be partly cloudy with light and scattered showers, and the average low should be about 53 or 12 degrees Celsius. Then tomorrow, you can expect more of the same, and the highs will be around 67 or 19 degrees Celsius. And that is it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.48 shekels to the American dollar. For more news from ILTV, please like ILTV on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube. I'm Aaron Porras. And I'm Natasha Kirchak. Thanks for watching.